Welcome to Maxwell Institute Conversations, special videocast episodes of the Maxwell Institute podcast, hosted by Terrell Givens and created in collaboration with Faith Matters Foundation. You can watch this episode in your podcast app, or if you're on the run, listen to the audio version. Does God ever get surprised? Brian Kershisnik is a Latter-day Saint and an American painter who suggests that the answer is yes. Latter-day Saints believe in a God who can be surprised, who can be delighted by the creativity we express. Kershisnik describes painting as a method of discovery and inspiration. So like God, an artist can be surprised by her own work. Part of making things is uh, you have an idea, you have a plan, but part of the process is letting the is letting what happens show you stuff and teach you stuff and and show you something from a new angle that is that is a delight and uh, and I use the same word a surprise this episode is more visual than usual with examples of Krishisnik's art so audio listeners might want to check out the video on YouTube it's Brian Krishisnik talking with Terrell Givens in this episode of Maxwell Institute Conversations Hello and welcome to another conversation. My name is Terrell Givens and my guest today is Brian Krishisnik, uh, one of my good friends and one of the, the great uh, Mormon artists of our day. Truly happy to have you with us today, Brian. Thank you, Terrell. I'm, uh, yeah, that's, I'm a little startled at uh, that introduction, but I hope that's true. It is. I think it is true. Uh, and we're going to be talking a good deal about your art. We're going to be looking at some specific examples of your work. But we want to start off by getting uh, to know you a little bit better. Uh, some in our audience might not be familiar with, with, with you as a person as well as an artist. And uh, so let's start with a cheerful question like, uh, what might your obituary look like? <laughs> um, if you had to just imagine a couple of things that would, would be on it. If you were to end your, your mortal, mortal life at this point, what would it say? Um, uh, I think that it would... I hope that it indicates that I died in the middle of a lot of good projects, and I, yeah. I, I aspire to uh, uh, I aspire to uh, unfinished business. I suppose I'm. I, I there are many things I want to sum up, but uh, I, I I hope that all the way through that I'm engaged with things that I care about and that are troubling me and that are stretching me and. I aspire actually more to being. Uh, I hope that I, m that I'm a, a to be a good human being rather than an artist. Obviously, you're talking to me here because of my profession, but I derive a lot of power, I think, in my art from a search to deepen myself as a human. I hope that shows up in my obituary. I think uh, talking to a friend recently, I it, it considered for the first time that I should maybe write it. Well, give us give us a, a quick overview of your life up to now. Mm. Uh, just, just biography. Yeah, I, just yeah. biography. Um, my father uh, was a petroleum geologist. Uh, both my parents were uh, born in Rock Springs, Wyoming, and part of the agreement when they married was that they were going to leave Rock Springs. They they wanted to get out and see uh, uh, the world. My father was in a vocation that allowed for that. Their first assignment was in Sicily, and uh, that was before I was born. I'm the youngest of four boys. When I was born, they were living in Oklahoma City, but just very briefly, I have no memories of Oklahoma. I left, I think, when I was one, but at, um, at five years old, we moved to uh, Portuguese West Africa, to Angola, and that's, I have some memories before that, but that's where I start kind of remembering the, the chronology right. and the narrative. Um, that was very exciting, and my parents loved uh, adventurous, overseas assignments, and so it didn't occur to us children to not love them, too. Um, when I was eight, we moved to Bangkok, Thailand. Uh, I was baptized in a swimming pool in uh, Bangkok. Your parents were LDS? Yes, my father actually uh, was not until I was about 14. I was baptized by my older brother. My father was not a member at that point. Um, and my mother actually became a Catholic to marry my father. Her, her, her situation growing up was uh, uh, complicated and difficult, and, uh, and uh, she, was, she was raised, her, her mother 
had raised her as a Latter-day Saint, but had died when my mother was eight. And things got a bit complicated. And in the end, uh, um, mom, having uh, become a Catholic to marry my father, missionaries knocked on her door and she burst into tears and they didn't know if they had a <laughs> lunatic or a, a golden uh, contact. But anyway, she, she decided she needed to come back and to raise her children uh, as Mormons. My father was not interested at the time in joining, but, uh, but thought well, they should go to church together. So for my youth, he always came, yeah. um, but uh, um, joined then when I was 14. And so um, uh, that was in Texas. So after Thailand, we moved to Texas. And then for my senior year in high school, we moved to Islamabad, Pakistan. And I was there uh, during the Iran crisis, and there were some disturbances in Islamabad where the embassy was burned. And our Not an Amer a typical American teenage youth. No, no. I was graduated early because of the... Uh, because of the uh, the, the attack to our school, we were evacuated, and uh, so I found myself done with high school in November of my senior year. My brother was at the University of Utah, so I went to Salt Lake and started uh, uh, school at the, there, U? at the U. Yeah, with no notion of what I wanted to pursue as a vocation. I was I was a curious kid and and interested in a lot of things and good at things, uh, uh, but it didn't it didn't occur to me what I would do for. So what did you end up majoring in? I uh, started out thinking I wanted to pursue architecture. And so I, I took a, a, uh, uh, just a general education class in architecture from Peter Goss at the U and, and thought, that's what I want to do. And so I, um, at the time, they had no undergraduate degree in architecture. So I was taking some art classes and enjoying them. And I thought, well, I'll just get an undergraduate degree in art and then uh, a graduate degree in architecture. Turned 19, went on a mission to Denmark, decided when I came back I would divide my degree. So I went to BYU for my undergraduate degree in art and then determined I would then go to the U for architecture, but got derailed. Very, fairly quickly as I pursued my art studies, it became apparent that there was, there was something in there that was trying to get out. And, yeah. uh, and so I, I initially assumed that I would teach all of my all of my uh, role models were instructors. I had not known, I had not grown up knowing artists or knowing, ever having been in a studio. And so uh, I assumed that I too would be, uh, become a professor, but in the process just became tangled up in the process of making paintings and yeah. such. You know, you said a minute ago that, I, I, that I'm, I'm having you on as a guest because of your professional status and qualifications. It's not strictly speaking true. Okay. Um, because I, you know, in, in all of my interactions with you, I see you as a holistic individual, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and, and art is one part of that. Um, but it seems to me that it's integrated into uh, a life in a very thoroughgoing way, and I, I would find it hard to separate out what you do professionally yeah, from I, who you are. I, I appreciate that, because I, I very much try, uh, my discipleship, what I do in the studio, what happens at home, I, I try as much as possible to, to integrate those. tie those together yeah. and, and to have the, those different things feed each other. My friendships are hugely important to me in the development of all of those other facets. Right. Uh, and, uh, and so, I, yeah, I mean, I, I, I appreciate that. And I think that, there are, I think that there are things that are interesting about my work that emerge very much from my life, from my relationships with my friends and my family and my yeah, children. Yeah, I mean, it's commonly observed of Latter-day Saints, right, that we are something more than a denomination. And, and yeah. sociologists struggle with this, right? Are we a global tribe? Are we an ethnicity? <laughs> are we a subculture? And there's a sense that, that something about Mormon activity and engagement in the church is all pervasive. Um, but that's not, to me, the interesting thing that explains the Mormon identity. I think it has more to do with a the theology that is all-encompassing. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and you can't segregate our, our religious beliefs from our kind of daily engagement, what it means to be human or a father or, or a child or anything else. Without imperiling them. Yeah. You know, that, I mean, you can and people do. Right. And, but but it, it, it's, it, it messes things up. And, yeah. and obviously, I, I would by no means maintain that I am 
wonderfully consistent and all those things. I, I aspire to do that. I aspire to, um, to integrate those things. But, but frankly, going to work is, it, it is work, it is, it is sweat, it is labor, it is, uh, it is a difficulty, but it, it is those things very much like discipleship is. Discipleship is not always the conduit to the heavens opening up. There's a huge amount of it that is, that is, is working through current yeah. difficulties or yeah, current no. good and bad things. You We're going to see, see that in some of your work in yeah, just I a hope few so. minutes. I yeah. hope so. Yeah. And, the, um, but, and, and painting is very much like that, too. And I think that in some ways people have a sense of, in, in, uh, in examining a religion, that they that they want all, they just want all the good parts and 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 um, I love it that in the dark in several sections in the dark and covenants you know the Lord is saying to various people uh, cast your mind back to when I spoke peace to your you know I'm I'm paraphrasing but when I spoke Section peace to your six, mind. Yeah. and uh, and I I think that there's a huge amount of our lives where we we need to do that that we're not we don't live constantly in this uh, in feeling that presence, we we have it, we remember it, we look forward to it, and we sort things out in between. Yeah. So, anyway, that's, and that's that is actually a good description of what happens in the studio too. I think people have a notion that you go into the studio and the heavens open and you then execute something. And a lot of it is very much like cleaning out the stables, or you know, it's. I think there's a Van Gogh quote that I haven't been able to find that where he says it's really more like coal mining than anything else. <laughs> you know, I come from a long line of coal miners, actually, so maybe yeah, that's yeah. why I ended up in art. Okay, let me ask you this question. I, I uh, generally reference William Wordsworth and some of his words that I love when he refers to the fact that there are in our existence spots of time. And he goes on to say that there are these moments that have this power, uh, this transformative kind of catalyzing uh, influence in our lives that give new direction or shape to mm. who we are mm. spiritually, professionally, emotionally. Can you think of two or three moments in your life that just stand out where a window opened to new possibilities? Yeah, I... I um... I remember actually one that comes to mind was uh, as a missionary, and I had read the scriptures. I, I was a dutiful seminary student, you know, and I had read the scriptures and, and loved them, I would say, and had a testimony of them. But on my mission was uh, diving into them it, differently. Yeah. And I remember this one experience of reading in the book of Ether, um, and uh, and I, I have, of course, my missionary scriptures, and they're all marked up. And most of the things I don't now know why that was interesting to me at the time. But, but I remember this kind of remarkable revelatory experience reading in Ether 12. And it's a, it's a scripture we quote all the time about. We, we actually, it is often quoted as weakness is becoming strengths, but that's not what the scripture says. And I, and I, I remember, uh, I remember. Uh, kind of feeling like I'm having this conversation, or or I'm present somehow with Moroni as he is, as he's lamenting to God about the weakness of what he's writing, you know, and he, yeah. and he, he says, "Oh, the Gentiles are going to laugh at this, and because of this, we stumble because of the placing of our words." And you, you know, he says, "He says you make us that when we speak, we can speak by the Spirit, but when we write, it's it's a problem," and. And I, I, and I, w I was very much with Moroni and saying, no, 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 you're doing great. This is wonderful. And, yeah. and, and God answers Moroni in that uh, chapter by essentially saying, yeah, ouch. Um, but, uh, fools mock, but they'll mourn. Uh, and, they, and if they all acknowledge their weakness, then they won't take advantage of your weakness. He essentially says to Moroni, yeah, yeah, there are problems with it. But if they acknowledge their weaknesses, then weak things, I would maintain this book will become strong unto them. Yeah. And, and, and just when I realized that and, and, and realized that, that uh, becoming an active and important participant in the world does not require, it, it, that it can happen without my having to become this perfect thing. Yeah. That, that if we engage together as humans, 
uh, in a way that, that where we acknowledge our own weaknesses, then we can become strong to each other. Then, then I mean, the Book of Mormon, which is, you know, which I hold to be scripture. And, uh, st- there, there are problems with it, but that's okay. Moroni yeah, acknowledges yeah. that. And, and it, it sounds to me like, like you're making a, an important distinction, which I would make, too, between weaknesses and weakness. Uh, in other words, do you, do you think that part of what is being described here is a generalized condition of inadequacy? I think sometimes we think that, oh, God gives me a tendency toward alcoholism, or he gives me this right tendency towards it's, it's, you know, moral flaws or failings. Yeah. And, and I get the sense, no, what God is saying is that you are constructed in such a way. I put you into a moral context and, a, and an embodiment such that you're inadequate. And yeah. now, now what do you do from there? Because yeah. I will sanctify you in spite of those things, not contingent upon some kind of perfection that you achieve. Yeah, I, 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 uh, one thing I find often in conversations about God is the, the, the doctrine that he created us is often discussed like he built us from a kit, yeah. you know, rather than, rather than something more like a father, you know, yeah. that, yeah. that, uh, that, that, like you say, a tendency to chew my fingernails was not a piece placed in there to see right. what I would do with it. But right. I, I, am in, I am in a condition, and, a, and, and also in this fallen world, in a broken condition. And, um, and so, so it is important in that circumstance for me to, uh, uh, the way to maintain the proper amount, appropriate amount of humility is to acknowledge that myself and be careful about the demands I make on the people around me. I, I mean, I feel like like uh, Jesus' injunction to judge not, that you be not judged, is essentially him saying, don't judge because you have no idea, you yeah, know? Yeah. That, not that judgment is bad, but that, but just you got to be really careful about making determinations because you're, you're really operating in a very limited circumstance. So this, this insight that you, that you come to at, what, the age of 20 or so in yeah. your mission— about uh, the inadequacy yeah. of, of, our, of ourselves, our failings, and the messiness of the human condition. Yeah. Is that part of what you think is, is, is pervading your art as one of your themes? Yeah, I think so. I, I, what, one thing that I feel like began to be introduced at that instant is um, because of our love and affection for truth and for God and for the gospel, we tend to screw to try to imagine that they're a little cleaner than they actually are. And yeah. that leads to some uh, difficulties. Yeah. And, uh, and to kind of acknowledge that, no, 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 we're, we're working in a circumstance that is, bro- that is broken in yeah. many ways, that yeah. we are being redeemed from a broken circumstance, yeah. and we should do our best. We should yeah. do our best, and we, we, are, we, we are weak. Yeah. Uh, we we behave in weakness, and so uh, I I need to be careful in uh, in in, do, in including that in pictures. But the way it shows up is that I want to paint people that are very human. Yeah. Uh, when I paint dancers, these are heavy footed dads. You know, th- these are not trained Degas ballerinas. Yeah, that's right. And yeah. I I love his work, and but I I'm kind of looking at a different thing. But even Degas in those paintings would often paint them backstage, paint them right. when they're not being picturesque, when right, they're scratching right. their backs and such. I think that, I think that those actually were very influential in, I mean, yeah. in my dancer yeah. paintings. Yeah, I want to go off on a tangent here for a moment because you, you, you've used the word brokenness four or five times. Um, and, and, of course, you know, Fiona and I have spoken a lot recently in our work about First Nephi 13, the original translation. Yeah, I love which, that insight. In that which we're wounded. There's yeah. this woundedness. And I, you haven't used the word sin when you talk about uh, brokenness or when you talk about weakness, which I think is important. I think sin is real. There is yeah, sin. But I, but I think the reality in which we are immersed is not a primal condition of sinfulness as much as it's an earthly condition of brokenness. Yeah. And I was reading a, a new translation of the New Testament recently. And uh, Luke 4, where Christ announces himself in the synagogue, which I think is a, is, it's a crucial scripture because that is how Christ presents himself. This is who I am. You want to know who I am? Here are the words of Isaiah. <laughs> and the way that this is, is, is more fully rendered, I think, in a better rendering of the Greek, he says, I'm come to liberate those who are broken by calamity. 
Mm. And it's that phrase, broken by calamity, that really, really mm. speaks to me. And uh, I think this might be a good time to, to refer. How is it in King James? Uh, uh, bind up the wounded. Bind up the wounded, uh, uh, something about the brokenhearted and, yeah. and uh, liberate mm. the captives. Mm-hmm. Um, but this might be a good time to refer to one of your paintings, which is one okay. of my favorites, <laughs> which is, it's one of a series, I think. Uh, is this right? Jesus and the Angry Babies? Yes. Do I have that right? right? That's right. That and, is... uh, and I think we have a, a, a visual that we can show here for those who are, who are watching. Um, but I can see it here in, in the studio. <laughs> and uh, I don't know how you can look at this painting without just erupting in a delightful kind of laughter. <laughs> Um, part of it is because of so, the a slightly I, irreverent laughter. A slightly man. <laughs> irreverent, but it's it's an appreciative laughter. Um, it, there's nothing mocking about it, but there's this kind of look of consternation yeah. on the face of of the Christ as he yeah. holds babies who are fussy yeah. and upset. And so, um, one thing I love about your art is that there's a whimsical quality to it, but there's a there's a deep profundity that underlies that whimsy. Uh, can you talk a little bit about this painting and how it how it speaks to you? Well, uh, initially, uh, I have a good friend uh, that I, I play music with, Steve Vistana, and we draw. He is a, also gra- he's a graphics designer, he's an artist, and we draw together, uh, just in our sketchbooks. I always have uh, my sketchbook handy, and just because uh, we'll maybe we'll talk about this a little bit later. But most ideas are bad, and so a sketchbook is a way to kind of make a note, and then decide later if it's useful yeah. or not. So in, in, my, in one of my sketchbooks like this, I, uh, just to entertain Steve, I, I making a bit of a pun on all of the paintings of Jesus with the cherubic, well-behaved children on his lap. I, I drew, I drew him, it's, it's just a little tiny thing uh, with these irate... Painted by people who have never worked in an LDS nursery, yeah. obviously. <laughs> well, and I mean, initially, we just laughed. Yeah. Because we thought it was funny. But the more I thought about it, the more I thought, you know, I believe that Jesus took the children on his lap. And I know children. And they weren't all happy about it. Yeah, you know? yeah. I mean, they, for some of them, it was mom's idea. You know? And, and, um, and, and it, it, it felt to me like um, it, a much better metaphor for my experience with discipleship and with other people to put... A, a lap full of fairly unruly uh, babies on Jesus's lap. That he continues to deal with us. He continues to work with us. He his, he continues to you know, to remember us, even though we are, for the most part, not well behaved. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and I don't. I, I mean, I know I I I know children, and I know they they it, that they weren't all picturesque. Instances. So, so you're kind of de-idealizing um, the sacred in some ways. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I'm trying to I'm trying to warm it up a little bit. Um, you know, there's a certain kind of there's a certain kind of laughter. Uh, um, I mentioned you know that when you talked about you know the the humor in this painting, and I, and I I use the word irreverent. There is there's a certain kind of of delight and humor um, that happens because of a certain irreverence that children introduce into our lives and certainly in our discipleship. I mean, I, re- I remember, uh, you know, little inappropriate things being yelled out during the passing of the sacrament or yeah, something yeah. like that. That, um, that having children, it, is a, it, it brings a certain unruliness to our existence. Yeah. And, uh, and I think it's healthy as disciples to think of ourselves in relation to Jesus as as children i mean as as you have mentioned we are we are of a species you know yeah, we yeah. we are related to him he he uh, heavenly father is referred to as our father because he's a he's our father he's an ancestor you know well, and and so um i i, I like to it, it, when I paint Jesus, I certainly do have no intention at all of being disrespectful to the Lord, but I, I like to remind us of, of the warmth of the fact that he came into one of these. He became one of us. Uh, um, as, even though in pictures and literature we, we, we make it so 
uh, everything happened in, uh, almost according to some divine script. I think that I, I believe in a Jesus who was surprised by events and who reacted to events and, and who became annoyed at his disciples because they didn't understand. And, uh, yeah. you know, that, and I feel like that's, it's important to include that. See, see, I, I think I would characterize what you're doing maybe a little bit differently. I think that what you are doing is you are reinscribing a new definition of the sacred. Is what yeah, I okay. I like that. And, and here's what I mean to by that. To include some other things. Exactly, exactly. Um, Phil Barlow, um, who, who I have to have on sometime just to talk about this one idea, but he said to me something that caught me up short. He, he said, don't you think at times that we, we err in making Christ or the atonement into idols? Mm. And I thought, well, how can you make that which is the most sacred into, I mean, we, mm. right. But I think this is in, in part what he means is, is that it, to strip something of, of all of its rough edges isn't to sacralize it, right? It's to denude it of that which makes it real and sacred. And I'm thinking, for example, of John chapter 8, that moment where, right, the woman is caught in adultery. Mm. Mm. And Jesus says, well, if you... If you're without sin, go ahead and cast the first stone. Then he kneels down and he, and he writes in the sand. You know, and you've got right, centuries of commentators <laughs> saying, oh, he was probably writing some profound, you know, you know, cri- you know it was cryptic, but it was, there was something really profound and godly and this message. And I think he was doodling in the yeah, sand, yeah. right? That's, that's a human thing to do. You just kind of, while you're waiting for people to, to make up their minds what they're going to do. But we don't want to see that. That's too human. That's too real. It sounds like, from the text, that he is distracted by yeah. what he's doing. He stands up and, oh, woman, where are thine accusers? Right, you know, that right. it, it does not sound like he continues to engage them with, with mysterious yeah. things on the ground. Yeah. yeah. I, I, and, uh, again, I, I'm supposing, just like these people for centuries have been supposing, but I, I am comfortable with the fact that it, it that. It may have been yeah. just drawing something. Or... So, so I'll give a name to, to what you're doing here. I, I will call it desanitizing the sacred. Well, I, and I, I feel like the, the advantage to that, if, if people can not be offended by it, is that when we, we tend to scrub the sacred in the past, and I feel like it robs us of experiences of the sacred in the present, because yeah. our current sacred experiences also have messy elements. And, and I think that sometimes we tend to diminish them because that's not what happened. That's, that's not what happened if, to Joseph, or that's not yeah. what happened to Jesus, yeah. or that's not what happened yeah. to Moses. Yeah. And yeah. I think it is what happened to Joseph and Jesus and Moses. I yeah. think their experiences, someone walking by in, in Jerusalem would not have known that it was Jesus because he was glowing and beautiful and Perfectly right, right, uh, right. Uh, kept, you know. The, and, and, and doesn't this same tendency come back to bite us when it comes to how we idealize our own prophetic legacy? And, yeah. and, and I'm thinking, for example, of, of Bushman's book, uh, mm. Rough Stone Rolling, and the various responses to that book. And I was with him at one fireside where somebody said, thank you for writing that book because it helped me leave the church. And, <laughs> oh, uh, you know, of course, that you know that's, that's the kind of thing that Richard obviously hates to hear. Yeah. But then you have the response of my son, who at the time was on a mission, who went through a very um, unorthodox, unensign like trajectory in his own life. And he wrote me from his mission, and he said, I, I read Rough Stone Rolling, and it was the most inspiring thing I've yeah. ever read. Because I thought, if God can yeah. work with that, yeah. then he can work with me. That's the, that's the miracle that I think is indicated in Ether 12. Yeah. At, um, and, and I think that I think you're right that we we do we do these great people a disservice by carving them in marble yeah. and not allowing them uh, yeah. errors or not allowing them flaws in any kind in any way. That I I think that um, I think that we we then kind of suppose that we ourselves are somehow excluded from participation in certain sacred events because we certainly know we're right. not perfect. Right. Right. And um, well, let's. Yeah, I, I love that because actually, the the chi- the, the the children being unruly on Jesus's lap is not unsacred. It, right. It, I hope it's not unsacred because most of my experiences with Jesus 
involve a degree of my own unruliness, you know, and but the sense of his persistence in reaching. I I think it's a I think it's a really healthy way to look at it that he's he is he is someone who is reaching to to heal wounds many of which we did not inflict. Now, we've exaggerated them and we haven't taken care of them and we have, you know, we make a lot of messes for ourselves, but we, we're, we're in a circumstance that warrants a great deal of grace. Probably, not, maybe not as much grace as he continues to extend. I think it is, that part of the miracle is that, uh, that he, I think where, where maybe other, I mean, I have no, no, uh, knowledge of this kind of interaction, but where the universe might be looking at this fallen world and say, you know, cut that one loose and start again, you know, and, and I think the miracle is that, no, he continues. Yeah. He continues to work, even though Lucifer continues to work as if it, he, it, he's acting like someone who feels like he can succeed, and God continues to push the cause forward. And and uh, you know, with the work for the dead and missionary work, and and you know, yeah, yeah. yeah. that th- these things continue to push forward, it show and it, and it's astonishingly courageous, brave, inventive, creative deity who who amazingly cares about me, you know, yeah. and us and yeah. you. And yeah. Well, let's segue from that picture then to one that I think, in some ways is influenced by the same sensibility, which is the descent from the cross, mm. um, which is not whimsical, but it no. also in, in some ways desanitizes the, the sacred in the same way. So if we could, if we could look at that picture now, uh, the descent from the cross, of course, is, is a well-established theme in religious art that goes yeah. back many, many centuries. And I think some of the greatest religious art ever done is on that, on that theme. Yours breaks in many ways with the tradition and introduces some some novel dimensions and perspectives. Can you talk a little bit about those? Well, uh, I, I, of course, I I couldn't address a subject like that without being, you know, very much aware of Caravaggio and Rubens and right. Rembrandt and um, and and trying to go to a subject like that without being intimidated by, you know, the burden of the, the other great artists dealing with it. But um, I, it, we're t- we've talked now about two paintings that both have Jesus in them, which which does which describes a you know a very small percentage of my of your total output. I feel like I feel like my work is uh, religious, even though it it seldom illustrates something from the scriptures. But th- but these two, uh, of course, do uh, Jesus with children and and the descent from the cross. Um, the the Having painted that large monumental uh, nativity painting, it's 18 feet long or something like that. I mean, it's, it's big. I, that painting was done, was the first monumental, what I, I call a sacred subject which, when, it's a, when it's something from the scriptures or from sacred history. And uh, the, so the first time I tried a monumental sacred subject, it, it worked Surprisingly well. I mean, I was surprised. Is that in myself. the Springville Museum? Is that where? It is? No, that's excuse me. That's in uh, that's at BYU. The they BYU and it, they it. own it. It was purchased and donated to BYU Museum. Okay. That painting um, is generally looked at as being so optimistic. Certainly, birth is a very a, a time full of promise and optimism and such. I I feel like nativity is a little more complicated than that than than just giddy delight and optimism especially if you consider the cost of the uh, babes of bethlehem yeah well and and i i you know for example there are some of the angels in that painting that are crying and people say oh they're crying for joy and and i say you know they they know the stature of the being that is now compressed into this little purple hungry uncoordinated yeah Human, you know, he came, the miracle of, of the nativity. condescension. That yeah, Nikolai that the it. condescension is that he came into our 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 dirt and our milk and our blood and our sweat, and you know, he came he he, he came here. He came, and and I, I feel like that would be in the moment, even if it was the, our only chance, it would still be kind of upsetting for the <laughs> angels who who knew the contrast. Ah, you know, are, are we sure this is a good idea? Um. 
the, um, and so it was years before I, I tried another monumental sacred subject. And I wanted to go to the other end of the story. Uh, and so I chose the dead Christ. And uh, because I, I feel like, like when, we, when we read the story of, at, at the conclusion of the Gospels, that um, you and I know how it's going to end. We've read it before. We've heard it before. We know what's going to happen in a few days. Right. And, of course, Jesus had prophesied to them, too, what was going to happen in a few days. But this had never happened, and they were not thinking about that. They, they were, as they were taking down his dead body, which is also a little peculiar to me, that the Romans would have allowed that to happen. I think that's kind of a beautiful thing, that, that, they, that, they let, that they let the family deal with the body. Because, of course, the Romans would have just been in a hurry and bones breaking and such as they, you know, take the corpses down that they let his family do it. And so, so I, as I painted it, I'm thinking about the difficulty, just the work involved of dealing with the corpse of their fallen hero. And, and for them at that moment, they can't, I, I imagine they can't perceive how this can end well, how, how this can be resolved, how this can be included in what they thought was the redemption they were looking for through this Christ. And, um, and, and so we re, as I painted it, I, was, I kept on saying, it's going to be okay, you know, it's going to be okay, but you, they don't know that. And, and I thought, you know, we, we rob Jesus of a, an amazing amount of courage and creativity and, and brilliance in his fulfillment of that sacrifice because we know that it, it succeeded. And, and we... we I don't read Jesus in the garden pleading with the Father that if this cup can pass. I, I don't read somebody who just knows exactly what's happening. He's just got to go through the motions. I, 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 I see someone who is advancing with unspeakable courage in the midst in of... In front of a very a, real abyss. A, a real abyss that is upsetting to him, yeah. you know. And, um, and so I, I feel like uh, in some ways... The good news of the resurrection doesn't mean anything unless it emerges from his death and, the, and, and they are in the midst of that. And we spend more time in our lives in the midst of a problem that we don't know how it could be resolved than we do giddy about this, the resolution. Yeah. And, and I, I, I wanted to go right to the point of the death. C.S. Lewis says something I think really pertinent in this regard in one of his books where he's talking about the fall. And he says, God can make use of all that happens, but the loss is real. Yeah, I love that. And, and I, think that, I think that knowing how, knowing that Jesus succeeded in the atonement, we, we cast it in this kind of, uh, I, I think that the way I try to describe it is imprecise. I'm limited to human language and I, I'm, I'm trying to examine a, a, a cosmic thing from a from a human perspective, but but I I think we must not take out of it completely the amount of risk that was being undertaken on our behalf. Yeah. Um. I I, I don't know if I've described that uh, accurately or with the and, right and words. So you see, not just the the apostles who are grieving and mourning, as one might expect, but the angels themselves yeah. are it, shattered. Yeah. Uh, and. Uh, you know, some people in looking at this painting, and I don't make ultimate decisions about who knows what, in, even in my own pictures, but they'll say, oh, uh, why aren't the angels rejoicing? And, I, and I, I don't know that the angels knew how this was going to work out either. You know, I, I, I'm, I am confident that the Father and the Son were on it, you know, but but that it wasn't broadcast or else his enemies would know and would counter. I think, yeah. I think Lucifer killed him thinking he could take him out of the game, yeah. thinking that he could do this and that that, would, that that would prevent him from accomplishing what he needed to do. And I think that the father and the son saying, we will apply these cosmic precedents, legal precedents and these things, and that final act of murder will actually complete the the atonement part of of his mission and I uh, well it's a magnificent work well I appreciate that um, it truly is 
Uh, angels. Uh, I want to talk about angels. Mm. They figure so prominently in so much <laughs> of your work. <clears throat> and um, I have one delightful <laughs> rendering here, uh, which is called... Sometimes it's hard to be dead. Sometimes, and can you read the... Yeah. Well, this, uh, this uh, image came from a, another sketchbook drawing when I was doing research in Slovenia with my mother for family history research. And this, this uh, deceased uh, spirit here is saying, I love you and appreciate what you are doing, but you are often very stupid and it aggravates the crud out of me. <laughs> and so, this researcher down here. And uh, um, I, uh, I, I, my, my sense of our interactions with uh, otherworldly beings is also something that I, in my work, try to unscrub a little bit. Okay. Um, can, can I set this up a little bit? Make, it, just, make it a little more human, a little more of a human interaction. So, I, I just want to give a little of, of historical context here to highlight, I think, what is really significant about what you're doing here. It, it strikes me as terribly significant from a Mormon perspective if we realize that the very, very first thing that the Protestants did to the, to the Book of Common Prayer was to strip from the Book of Common Prayer all references to the dead, all prayers to the dead, prayers that were said for the dead. Mm. Because one of Luther's principal preoccupations was that we need to sever, to sunder the connection between the living and the dead, right? Once you pass the veil of, of death, that's done. Mm. We're, you're done and we're done with you, effectively. Our preoccupation is only with ourselves and with the living. And so, in, in, in some ways, contrary to this Mormon myth that the Reformation was a kind of grand prelude to the Restoration, the Restoration is first and foremost redressing what the Reformation had done, <laughs> which was right to sunder these into two completely discontinuous realms. Mm. And, you know, one question that I think, you know, some of us should be asking is, other than the obvious um, talent manifest in your work, why is it so popular in, in, in Mormonism today, right? And I'm thinking especially the, the you're probably your most popular one, She Shall Find That Which Is Lost. Mm -hmm. Is that the right? Yeah. I, I actually start to forget. I call it She Will Find What Is Lost, but I think what that is lost. which is might be in there too. She Will Find What Is Lost. My wife has, has a copy. She has a print of that in her study, mm. um, which is, again, a heavenly host, mm. assorted angelic beings, right, hovering over a woman. Mm. Um, so my sense is that, is that part of what you are doing is celebrating what I think is, in many ways, one of the greatest miracles of the Restoration, which is to say, no, we're still connected. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about that and, and how, how you've experienced that in your personal work? Yeah, I, uh, I have, w when you asked me the question initially about my obituary, I was, I was going to say then that I think a lot about death and about the dead. Um, I have not, not to the point where I've written my own obituary, but I collect death masks. I, uh, you know, I, I, um, I feel, I feel a connection to my ancestors, particularly ones that I have, um, uh, uh, sought out. Uh, I, what's interesting to me is in doing the research, um, there are certain individuals that are doing the counterpart to that research on the other side. I mean, I think everyone is interested, perhaps, I hope, but Florian Krzyzysznik and Leonard Durling, I, I mean, they just, their, their names, they just appear differently on the page, and they are doing something yeah. on that side as we are doing something on this side, you know, that, um, that uh, I don't, I don't know what it is. I, I think our understanding of what happens on the other side of the veil is very limited, and we fill in a lot of blanks. But, um, but I, I do feel very much uh, a that that the that the witnessing of the events in our lives and the influencing of the events in our lives by by otherworldly beings is is almost constant, um, and they're not all. It, it, they're not all the good ones. I've also had plenty of experiences where uh, it, the studio that I, uh, I, I m neglected to mention in my biography part that I lived in Kanash for 15 years, and I still have a studio there. And the building that I got was very full of uh, 
of spirits that needed to go <laughs> needed to go if this was going to be a productive place to work. And and, and what was interesting to me is, uh, I just the sense that I had is these these people. This is where they hang out. They 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 this they're the kind of dead ended people. The kind of spirits that I want to interact with don't just hang out in eddies and dark houses. They have stuff to do. These people have nowhere to go. And so I, as I worked on the building, I would just say, um, new management, I would just talk out loud while I was driving nails, say, I'm a disciple of Jesus, and anything that happens here, spiritually or physically, is going to be consistent with that. And so you, if you need to find a new place to be, go. And if you give me trouble, I'll, I'll get out my guns. But. See, see, Brian, this, <laughs> this is one reason why I admire you as, a, as an individual, really, as well as an artist. Uh, one of the greatest, maybe the greatest British scholar of, romantic, of uh, Mormonism said to me one time, he said, Terrell, Mormonism is never really going to achieve its potential and achieve worldwide respect until you learn to mythologize your scriptures as we have. You've got to be reading the Book of Mormon as allegory. You've got to be taking these sacred texts and turning them into metaphor. And I said, it's not going to happen. <laughs> it's, it's not going to happen. Um, and, and I think you represent a kind of right spearhead of this resistance to that is, of, of saying, no, we, we take these things seriously. Yeah. We're not going to make excuses for our belief that God literally spoke to prophets in yeah. our age, yeah. and that these encounters with the divine are not just mental phenomena, they're, they're, they're real. And you celebrate this in your canvases in a way that I think Mormons really rejoice in, and I think that's one I reason why so. you're such a loved artist uh, in our tradition. I hope so. And, and the fact that you can do it both with, uh, with feeling and also with, with gentle humor, <laughs> because certainly not all the dead are happy at, at what they see us doing, I'm sure. No, but, uh, but I, I, believe, I, believe in a, I also believe in a God who laughs, you know. And I, 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 think that, I think that just the way we interacting with our children and, do, and they do something funny or say something cute, and that's surprising to us, I, I believe that that is a part of God's experience, too. Yeah. Um, I, I have the sense, you know, this maybe is, I could be reading this wrong, but I have the sense that in working on things that, 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 this, that the spirits and the people who attend me are surprised by what I do, that life is not just a matter of, of t tapping into the ticker tape instruction and execution, that we, that we are obligated, I perceive, by Section 58 and other things, to participate creatively and actively in doing good, yeah. and and that there are times when I think I have surprised the people assigned to help me out, and they yeah. say, "Oh, yeah. oh, look how he's doing it. Oh, this will work well. Okay, we'll no, do I, this." I have, <laughs> yeah, I I wouldn't want to worship a god who couldn't be surprised. I yeah. want to feel I can do something that is unexpected. Uh, well, my my tiny little notion of creativity. Does can, uh, creativity cannot exist without an element of surprise? Now, I choose to read in the scriptures when God says, "And He saw that it was good." That that is a that is a that is a grand, ancient uh, uh, way of saying it, it turned out well. It turned, he all. really liked it. Yeah. That, <laughs> that, that, that I you know I mean maybe I'm reading too much between the lines, but that those are kind of examples of God saying. The f have you checked out the fjords? I mean, they are, ex they are made. Check this out. This is who did this. This is great. You know that yeah, uh, yeah. that that part of part of making things is uh, you have an idea, you have a plan, but part of the process is letting the is letting what happens show you stuff and teach you stuff and and show you something from a new angle that is that is a delight and uh, and I use the same word a surprise yeah, a surprise. Yeah. And uh, uh, I, I, my, the way I think now, I can't imagine an existence in which that stops happening. I right. can't. I, I, it doesn't, I don't believe in an existence where that stops happening. Well, let's round this out with, with a couple of final questions. Uh, what, what as a people and as a church do you think we do particularly well? The friendships that I develop 
in the process of functioning as a Latter-day Saint are, uh, are very meaningful. Uh, you know, obviously we get assigned to be home teachers, but sometimes that sets you up to connect profoundly with, yeah. with a human that you might not have ever that you would not have sought out, that would not have made sense. I right. think. I think that. I think that there are there are aff affections, close, warm, life changing affections that I have, con connections I have to people, because there because the structure set that up, and if there was not that structure, then it would then I I think Beautiful. it would not yeah. have happened. And what could we do better? Where are we deficient? I believe that we could be much better at allowing people to participate with us with their with their troubles and their doubts. I think that I think that I think there's a lot of I think there's a lot of departure from the church. Some of it might even be necessary. I mean, where people are at such odds, but I think there's too much of it that happens because we, as a people, culturally don't know how to accommodate people who are having trouble with something. Yeah. And and that is that is unnaturally and unnecessarily exaggerated. There's a kind of there's a kind of intolerance for uh, for for trouble. That that leads to unnecessary unnecessary uh, uh, conflict. Yeah, I'd um, say amen to that. I actually feel like to be a disciple at any time in any age has been to accommodate certain things that don't quite make sense to you. We don't emphasize that that you know that's not what the stories are told about. But but yeah, that, that almost wonderful. in every age there's been an issue or multiple issues that have been hard to carry. And that's why we have that example, right? I think in, in the book of John, right? Where the disciples hear him teaching about eating his flesh yeah. and blood and they... Yeah. I, I love that because yeah. they don't say, no, it's no problem. Uh, they, yeah. they don't, they don't, they, they I, I, what I hear them say, maybe I'm using too much imagination, although I think imagination is a useful thing in the scriptures, but they are essentially saying, I don't know what you're talking about, but this I know. Yeah. And so... Where would we go? Because this is this is this that's I not know. a powerful affirmation. Where else would we go? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. I mean, yeah. they, they're saying, well, if there was something better, maybe. But but yeah, that's <clears throat> beautiful. But but I, I think that what's beautiful about that is if we don't scrub it too much, it allows for that very human reality right. of right. yeah, I am I am part of something where there there are some difficulties. I love that. That I, I feel like this is changing culturally in the church, and I do hear more, uh, more voices of people not not taking pot shots at policies or anything like that, but but acknowledging that I believe I have a testimony, and it's okay if you know that I I'm struggling with this. Right. I, I feel like that that is more that 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 will allow more people to to not feel like they have to stay away if they're having trouble with this or that. Yeah. Right. Right. So anyway, I feel like we, I hope that I can, I hope, I'm trying to be a part of that solution. Of, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to be, I have a long ways to go myself too. Yeah. Last question. Yes. Holy envy. Um, do you have holy envy of any other faith, tradition, <sighs> denomination, culture? Yeah. Something you'd really love to see us appropriate and make ours. Yeah. Um, and this is, um, I feel like with the restoration there were there were so many things that uh, that were that were nebulous and mysterious that became solid for us. God has a body, a flesh and bone. That 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 that's a remarkable and amazing revelation. But I, I think I think we've erred on the part of simplification, and um, that that when when. When eternal life is to know the Father and Jesus, if that is eternal life, that it's got to be more than knowing that he has a physical body. That there, is, there are aspects of, 
of unfathomable mystery about godliness that I think we would do well to, to open ourselves to. Um, uh, and, and I think that, uh, I think that uh, there, are, there, there are aspects of that that Buddhists do better and the Catholics do better than we do. And, and, and I, I have been raised all over the world and having mostly being, you know, my friends were Muslims and Catholics and Protestants and such, that, that there, are, there are great aspects of the whole truth that, uh, that there are some disciplines that make more room for wonder. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I, I really think so. I think that, um, I think that uh, the, the, this is a, actually a, a story that Faith uh, found when we were doing some research on a project of the, of the you know, obviously, you know, the five blind yeah, men and the, the elephant. You know the story of the five blind elephants and the man. <laughs> no. That, okay. uh, that the five blind elephants want to experience man. And so the first one comes up to man and feels him and says, man is flat. And so the other five elephants come over and they say, yeah, he's flat. <laughs> you know, that we, we do that to truth a lot of times. We, we smash it down and flatten it and then make sure everyone agrees, you know. And that, uh, that there are... That, uh, it took me a minute to get the man is flat. Yeah, okay, yeah the, elephant. the elephant feels man and, just, and he's, he's flattened. And, um, and, and I think that it's okay for me to sit next to you in high priest group and say, huh, his experience of this is different than mine. And, and he, that doesn't mean I'm right and he's wrong. That, that, that this is a big enough thing that it can have multiple facets and I, and I would do well, even if I don't agree with every premise you make, that, that I, there are things that I have to learn about this larger thing by other angles being taken at it. So I, anyway. Right. Well, Brian, thank you for your life as a disciple and oh. as an artist. And uh, keep amusing us and keep provoking us. Oh, I hope so. I hope so. Thanks thank for you being very with us. much, Terrell. Thank you. Thanks for being with us. <laughs>